Good morning, Spirit of Prophecy Church. How are y'all doing today? And our audience out there online, I'd like to welcome y'all today. We've got an awesome teacher here today. This is Danny Miller. He is an awesome teacher. He's great with the word. I just can't say enough about him. Anyway, I'm going to pray with him right now because i got to pray for him before he starts so he'll do even better than he normally does. So anyway, dear Heavenly Father, I lift Danny Miller up to you this day, and I ask you to bless him with divine wisdom and knowledge that he will speak your words and not necessarily his, but he will speak the message that you want him to. He will touch hearts, he will touch minds, and he will change lives. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray this day. Amen. Amen. Danny Miller, my awesome friend. Wow. What an introduction. I love it. Gosh, this is so weird. I'm preaching. I'm teaching to a bunch of chairs today. <laughs> All righty. Well, it helps if I get the clicker. Well, today, as you might see, the title is Consequences. And I don't, maybe you've noticed it, but I've noticed this over the years. It seems like people more and more have the attitude of that they can do what they want, when they want, how they want, to whoever they want. We have this attitude we can just do anything and we'll get off scot-free. Well, guess what? In some cases, there's an element of truth there. there and but that's not what the reality is. The reality is you have consequences for every action you take. Some of you will remember this, especially of the older, like me with the stomach coming out and the lack of hair. When you went to science class, what did you hear? Especially if it was chemistry. For every action, there's a reaction, right? Same thing goes from a spiritual standpoint. The actions you take, even down to the very thoughts. Because God doesn't look just at the outside. He goes much deeper. He goes to the inside. And he looks and sees what's there. It's very easy not to do things as far as taking physical actions or speaking certain words. But what about your thoughts? What about your thoughts? Because God is going to not go just to the outside. He's going to the core of your be being, to your very thoughts. And he's going to look there and say, hmm, what are those thoughts like today? So you're not getting away with it. So I just felt like this was a topic that w needed to be discussed. Now, what you do, the action you physically take, what you say, and even the thoughts you have can have an impact on you. And note this, the quality of life, the degree of that impact, and how long it takes before manifesting itself will vary from person to person. The point in this lesson is showing you the validity of that opening statement, which is no point one, really, by showing you different Bible verses that hopefully, at the very least, you're going to think about this. You're going to say, all right, what are my actions saying about myself? And to a very large degree, your relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Now, let's take a look. What does uh, consequences mean? So let's first start by looking in the dictionary. This is from the uh, Merriam-Webster website. Consequence is a condition or occurrence traceable to a cause. So if we have a consequence, there is something that triggered it. There's some action, even if it's a thought, that is causing the result to occur. And so we are going to look at it a little bit differently. I could give you a lot of verses that 
you might say, show us the mechanics of that process. But today, we're going to be spending most of the time in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at examples of people who made a choice. Whether it was good or bad is, is not so much the point here. It's to show you they took an action. And because of that action, a consequence, a result occurred. So, Deuteronomy 3, verse 23, 25 to 27. Now, some of these verses you have and stories you probably have heard. Some you may not have heard, but regardless, there are still some very valid points that talk about consequences. And I've, Now, this is Moses. This is just prior to them crossing over the Jordan to start the occupation of the land that was promised to them centuries ago. So he goes, and I besought the Lord at that time, saying, I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that godly mountain in Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth for me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee, speak no more of this matter. Get thee up to the top of, I guess it's Pegasus, and lift up thine eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward. And behold it with thine eyes, for thou shalt not go over this Jordan. So what did he do? What he did earlier as they were wandering through the wilderness, remember there's two times where he brought forth water. The first time he did it exactly like God told him to do. But the second time, he did it not do it the way God told him. What was his consequence? He wasn't allowed to go over Jordan. That may seem somewhat severe. But God is a God that has a standard. And we have lost sight of that. How do we, how do we know that we have this attitude? Let me give you a couple examples. Many, many years ago, we used to have prayer in our schools. We don't anymore. That's basically, for the most part, because of a woman named Madeline Murray O'Hare. She brought a lawsuit in the, in the courts and won that effectively banned prayer in schools, a set-aside time where everyone would pray. It also, though most people don't know it, pretty well put a, a quash on the reading of the Bible. Not only prayer, but even reading Bible in the schools. That lawsuit pretty well did away with all of it. There was a judge, another example, it was a judge in, in Georgia. He had a copy of the Ten Commandments hanging on the front of his courtroom. He was told he had to take them down. Think about this. We're talking about the Ten Commandments. The basis of all Western Judeo-Christian law is based on the Ten Commandments. Now, according to the reports I read, he never directly said anything about them when issuing his rulings or giving, talking with the lawyers. He just had them up there so people would see them. And he was told to take them down. See, these are all different things that are not real big, but see, it's a cumulative thing as far as sometimes consequences. You don't always see it right then. Sometimes it takes times for the consequences to manifest themselves. My mom's best friend, um, they yeah, before they were married, they used to room together. They, you know, they were roommates for years. Then they got married. Well, Catherine, her name was Catherine. Now, when I was little, I couldn't say Catherine, so I called her Khaki. I just couldn't say Catherine as a young, and the name stuck. 
so it was khaki. And actually, when I got older, just before she died, I called her Catherine one day, and she said, don't, don't you ever call me that. You call me khaki. All right. But she was a heavy smoker. Smoked? Oh, my God, that woman could probably knock down three packs a day if she wanted. You wouldn't guess what happened to her. She developed lung cancer about 30 years later. My mom went to see her about a, for and stayed with her about a week before her death. She sa it said it broke her heart. She, she wanted to cry. She literally, khaki, literally was for the most part bedridden, had an oxygen tank to the side of the bed and couldn't breathe without it. It didn't affect her initially, but that years of smoking finally caught up. And to see, you may be getting away with something now, but eventually it's going to, you're going to get, it's going to catch up with you. And, you know, you see people and they just seem to get away with murder. You know, we use that expression a lot. You're getting away with murder, man. <laughs> well, and unfortunately, um, just one other example. In Dallas, I know it happened in Dallas and cities across the country. There were DAs who were elected that flat out said, if a store is robbed and the value of the goods is less than X, I think one one jurisdiction said 600. We're not going to prosecute, and we're not really going to invest. The police aren't going to spend time investigating. You wouldn't guess what happened. As soon as that was said, the crime rate went up. Stores got hit big time. You know, people were, they, and they would take right up to the dollar value, and then they stopped because they knew they didn't have to worry about the police. The DA just said, if it's under a certain amount, we ain't going to mess with it. See, those are the things, actions that lead to uh, consequences. So Moses lost going over into the promised land because he disobeyed God. And I may, you may say, well, that's unfair. Well, God has a standard. And he expects us as Christians to follow that standard. Where's the standard? It's in the Bible. You're going to have to spend time reading your Bible if you want to get what the standard is. And if you need a cliff note version to Ten Commandments, there, there you go. You got a standard right there. Now, this is in Deuteronomy 4. There out therefore hearken, O Israel, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you. For to do them, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers giveth you. What came first in that verse? Stat, uh, hearken. We have a verb. We have a, a verb that denotes action. In this case, hearken. What are they hearkening to? Statutes and the judgments which I teach you. See, they had to do that first. And then what came? They may live and go and possess. So see, in this case, because they were following God, again, Jesus wasn't on the scene. This is Old Testament stuff. But because they followed God and they followed his statutes and commandments that had already been given to them, a positive result occurred, which in their case and ultimately, they did possess the majority of the land. They didn't possess all of it, and I don't necessarily have it in this specifically in the presentation, but some of the tribes, as they went into the land and took over those people, they didn't take over uh, completely. There are a couple of tribes where they got some of the land, but not all of it because of sinfulness of them. And they didn't get it all. So many times, if we want good things to happen to us, as this verse is saying is going to happen to the nation of Israel, we got to follow God. If we follow God, then at some point, 
good things are probably going to happen. I'll go ahead and, and talk on this now. I was going to wait, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it now. Does it say anywhere in this verse how long it will take? Is there any sort of time stamp that says by a certain date it's going to happen? I don't quite see it there. And that's the thing. And you'll see this, this pattern throughout the verses. God doesn't always tell us when the good things are going to come. How patient are you going to be? Are you willing to wait on God and let it do, let the actions or consequences occur in his timing? Or are you going to get mad because it wasn't when you wanted it to happen? We got to be willing to let God work things out. Sometimes they're immediate, but not always. Sometimes it takes time. All right, Deuteronomy 28. And it shall come to pass, and thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord to observe and do his commandments, which command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations. At this, I believe I'm correct, uh, verse 1 and 2 are the first two verses in a chapter where there's a long list of curses and, but also there's a long list of good things that will happen. You know, he's, he's saying he does these first two verses. All right, now here's what happens if you do them and gives you a list. And then he gives a long list, which is interesting because that length of that list is longer than the ones that are good, which I've always have thought interesting, of the curses. 53, our brother Bill says there are 53 verses of curses and maybe half that much on the blessings. 15. <laughs> so, see, but the point here is what occurred first, verse 1. And notice that word hearkens there again. So, that's the second time that we see it to observe and to do. See, as Christians, we are to not only observe, we're to do. That's when the results happen. We observe, and we observe by we do in action those things. Notice that he says, I will set you high above all nations of the earth. That's actually partially been fulfilled because they did take over a portion or a, a lot of that land. But it says they're all nations of the earth, and I think it's pretty clear that hadn't quite happened yet. But and then it says, Blessing shall come and overtake thee. And he notice it again the word hearken. Deuteronomy 32, 48 through 52. You may wonder, this verse talks about what, why did God say you can't go to Jordan? And the Lord responded, because he says, all right, you wanted to know why? Here's why. Verse 50, it's very small, I believe it's 50, yeah, 51. Because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Merakadish in the wilderness of Zion, because you sanctified me not in the midst of the children of Israel, yet shall thou see the land, but shall not go in. Because he, again, specifically disobeyed God, he had a consequence. And in this case, he did not cross over into the Jordan. Actions have consequences, brothers and sisters. Regardless of what you think, ultimately, you're going to have to face the, the music. Because one day, at some point in time, and it may, I mean, it may not occur while we're living on this earth. But I guarantee you, 
I promise you that one day we're going to go before God. We're going to go before the man, Jesus, that hung on the cross to take care of our sins and provide us uh, everlasting life. And we will have to give account of what we did. And it's not just physical actions. We got to remember, we got to remember that God looks at the heart too. He looks at the mind and he looks at our thoughts. I mean, I've never committed adultery. I've never had slept with a married woman. I've never done anything like that physically. But there are times I've seen a, a very attractive woman and my thoughts are for just a second going, it'd be nice to, to have her. Well, wait a minute. It's not really appropriate because she's married. I, I hope you're I hope one thing this teaching does is we gotta look past the outside. We gotta look at the inside. We gotta look of what we're thinking not just what we're doing. All right. Now, this story is uh, Joshua and Jericho. So, we look at uh, Joshua 6, 2 through 5, 16 through 18. The first, uh, verses 2 through 5 is showing what they needed to do. He is giving them specific instructions on how they can defeat the city of Jericho. So two to five, here are the instructions. Here is what you need to do. Verse, uh, later on we go to verse 16. And it came to pass of the seventh time when the priests blew with trumpets, Joshua said unto people, Shout! For the Lord hath given you the city, and the city be accursed, even it and all that are therein, to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And yea, in any wise keep your... Now notice what it says here, because something happens when they take the uh, city that one of their warriors didn't do what is contained in verse 18 from the accursed thing we don't know what the accursed thing is i never saw in these passages a specific statement of what it was but it doesn't matter because i'm pretty sure god communicated to joshua what that accursed thing was and the point is god said don't take it that should be enough right then and there God doesn't have to give you a reason for whatever actions he does or what actions he tells you to do. See, we, we want to, today's society, they want a reason. Well, why am I doing it? Well, I'm not going to do it unless you tell me why. Right? Y'all hear it? See that? All right, someone nodded yes. Good. At least I'm on the right track. But God... And this is going to probably sound bad. God doesn't care whether you like it or not. I mean, if he has something and a set of instructions and he gives you that he wants you to do, if you're a Christian, you better do it at the very least. But he wants you to do them. He wouldn't have given you the instructions or that course of action if he didn't want you to do it. And here, same thing. He gave Joshua a set a blueprint here's how you take the j j city and you will do it if you wanted to have be successful so what happens oh but look at verse one seven one four and six but the children of israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing i'm very bad at these names for Achan the son of karma the son of zabi and he, he took the thing, we'll skip the rest of the words, of, took the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. So someone violated the rule he had set down to Joshua, and he wasn't happy about it. 
Now, the consequence didn't, sometimes consequences show up in ways we do not expect or understand. Here's a case in point. So as part of the conquest, they went up against uh, the men of Ai, AI. And what happened? They fled. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Joshua's thinking, we were supposed to be victorious. We got our butts handed to us. Why? Why did this happen? You told us we were going to be victorious and we were going to win, and we didn't. And notice what Joshua did. He rent his clothes and fell to the earth. Do you do that? I had an incident that occurred last week or earlier this week. And I knew deep down in my heart I was wrong. I had no business doing what I did. And it wasn't, didn't necessarily hurt anyone, but the point was it was not something that as a Christian person I should have done. And that is probably one of the worst feelings I've ever had in my entire life. I mean, it upset me. When I got back home, I realized, what have in the world have you done? And I literally went to my knees in my, in my bedroom and prayed to God and said, I was wrong. I was wrong. And I, I repent. I repent of that. And, and I'm sorry. And, and I was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. Well, that's what Joshua was doing here. He's falling down. It's like he would come before this altar and, and be on his knees in front of the altar and says, I was, what happened? What did we do wrong? What action did we take that caused this result to occur? And so, and notice he did it until the evening. So apparently all day long, it was such a deal that he spent almost all day in prayer. And notice they put dust upon their heads. I mean, they're serious here. They want to know what happened. Joshua 7, 10 through 11. And I like this because in a way, the Lord is kind of, I think he doesn't say it, but I think the Lord was kind of upset with him. Like, why are you on your knees? You know what you did. And that's kind of way, get thee up. Wherefore, why, wherefore liest thou, thou dost upon my face? Why are you on your face? I already told you what you need to do. Israel has sinned, and they have transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the uh oh, accursed thing, and have stolen and disassembled, and they have put it even among their own stuff. So apparently, taking this accursed thing wasn't the only thing. They were going in there and stealing. But the, point, the main point here is they're doing things that is contrary to what God instructed or what God has told them on previous uh, occasions that govern their behavior and the way they're supposed to act. There's a consequence. They got slaughtered in that battle. And God said, all right. And so in this case, the consequence was a negative, wasn't it? All right. And what happened, uh, just to kind of finish that story up, Joshua went, uh, literally did a, for all practical purposes, a tent-to-tent -tent search until he found out who did it. You know what happened to those people? Here, I'll tell you. That whole bloodline was wiped out. They killed every one of them. Now, in this day and age, their punishments are not necessarily like that. You know, we don't wipe out an entire bloodline this day and age just because they stole. We, you know, we'll throw it, we find a person, and they go to jail. We don't wipe out their entire bloodline. Back in the Old Testament days, those, yeah. 
I mean, this was a serious thing. So we got to understand if we disobey God, what has happened here? So far, they disobeyed God, and what happened? Bad things happened to them, right? So let's move on. I always have liked this. This is David. Now, most everyone has heard this story, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. But basically, David saw someone who wanted her. She was married, and so she, he kind of goes in his heart, all right, how can I arrange for me to have her? So this is what he did. He basically sent a letter to the commander and said, send this guy to the front lines. Make sure he's up front because he'll probably be killed. Now, I'm sure the, the commander was kind of scratching his head. Why you purposely want me to put this man up front when you know full well he's probably going to die? But it wasn't that commander's place. He had orders. He followed them. So when the wife uh, heard that her husband had died, and at that point, David moved in and took her as wife. Was there any consequence? Well, not at that point. See, again, consequences, they don't always show up right then. Sometimes it takes time. My friend, mom's friend's khaki. 30 years later, she paid the price, and it was bad. From everything my mom said, it was one of the worst things she'd ever seen in her life, what that woman had to go through as a result. So consequences don't always appear right then. And sometimes people get in a false sense of security. Oh, I did this. Well, nothing's happened. I guess I'm all right. I'm good. No, you're not good. If you're a Christian, if you got that attitude, get rid of it because you're not going to get away with it. You may get away with it while you're on earth, but I'm telling you, I'm promising you, you're going to go before God and the man that hung on this cross and give it a count of what you've done. Whether it be good or bad, it doesn't matter. You're going to have to give an account of it. So why don't you, the best thing to do is just don't even get put yourself in that situation. Don't do the things that are contrary. I know we're human beings. We sin. So at some point, we're going to do it. We'll sin at some point. But it's the difference between, maybe there isn't, but in my mind there is. There's a difference between willful sinning and sinning because unintentionally maybe i'm the only one that makes that distinction but i i think it's there so what happens okay the prophet at that time comes to david and says i have a, something i want you to give a judgment on he gives the parable and this is David's response. David's anger was greatly against, kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that have done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have known thee, king of Israel, and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom. I gave thee the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. It's like he's saying, what else did you need? I gave you all these things, all these things that I promised you. I came through and I gave them to you. Wasn't that enough? Did you really have to go to the lynch to have a man killed just to get one more thing? I would have given you other things. You didn't have to transgress and violate my laws to obtain it. Wherefore thou hast despised. Note the word despise. Isn't that what we're doing when we violate God's statutes, laws, and commandments? Uh, again, I know we sin. But we have to have the attitude that every single second of the day and night, we're going to act in a manner where we are not disobeying God. I think it's not 
insignificant that the word despised is used there. Thou hast killed Urah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife. So now what are the results of his actions here? The sword, sword shall never depart from thy house because thou hast, there's that word again, despised me. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thy eyes and give them unto the neighbor, and she and he shall lie with the wives in the sight of this son. For thou, notice here, thou didst secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. And now this, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, and that the child that was born unto thee shall die. For the rest of his days David was in warfare after this incident. In many cases it was out of, of from other sons, from other wives, and they constantly from that point on were at war with David. And he never saw a time of peace after. He was always, or his nation, and was in a state of war with someone from that point on. See, consequences can be serious. Sometimes maybe a slap on the wrist. Maybe God just does a sound weird, a little chastising. But sometimes it's pretty heavy. And here's a pretty good, here's five things that happened to David, all negative because he decided he wasn't going to obey God. You don't get away with stuff, people. God knows, he knows your very thoughts. You're not getting away with anything in front of him. And he will, at some point, you're going to have to face the music and give an account of what you might have done, whether it be good or bad. Here's a case in Jeremiah where there was a king. And notice what he says. And I will cause them to be removed unto all kingdoms of the earth because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, for that which he did. Which he did indicates some actions. We don't know in this particular verse what they are. That's not the point. He, the, Jeremiah is trying to show them people that here are the actions that Manasseh did and here are the consequences, which in case they're going to be removed from power. Can you tell what number slide I'm on? Okay. All right, I'm starting to run out of time. Now I need to go over this real quick. I know I've talked a lot about the bad consequences, but guess what? God re re rewards you in a positive manner, too. So I'm going to go to quickly. This is Solomon. Basically, before Solomon rose to power, God came to him and said, Where is it? Ask what I should give thee. Notice what he says. Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and, and in righteousness. And then in verse 9, he says, Go, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? He just asked for judgment. He didn't ask for anything else. He All he asked, will you please give me judgment so I can judge appropriately and correctly? An understanding heart, that's all he asked for. Not money, not wives, not riches. Give me an understanding heart. What was the result there? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Notice in living what he says. I think we need to take note of it because you know what? I hear a lot of people asking for the things 
that God said Solomon did not ask for in this day and age. So he says, because not ask for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor have asked the life of thine enemies, but thou hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Wow. It's kind of simple when you think about it. He's asking, give me understanding. I think that's a good kind of thing to know for us to do. We need to go before God just like Solomon did and say, we need to make sure we ask for understanding. So why? So that we may in our actions as a result of that understanding be good Christian men and women who are fulfilling and doing God's will. Because we've taken the time, God, give me the understanding so I know what to do. Not, now, we're not necessarily going to be judging people on this earth, but we can, you know what we can judge? Whether it's right or wrong to take a certain action. And I have given thee that which I has not asked, both riches and honor. If you will walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father did walk, then I will lengthen my days. He said, hey, you follow what I say, I'm going to extend your life. And again, Solomon didn't even ask for that. So many times, if we follow God's statutes, laws, and commandments, He's going to give us stuff we didn't even ask for. Isn't that great? Isn't it kind of an incentive? If I follow God, we don't do it for the rewards. We do it because we want to please God. We want to show God, hey, I believe in what you said, and I'm going to follow in the same footstep. But isn't it great to know that there's a possibility we we may get more than we want. We can get more than we ask for. Not because we asked for it, because we followed God and Jesus. You know, again, I've I've made my mistakes, and a big one Tuesday night. But so I've got to learn and make sure I don't put myself in that situation again. All right, I've got time for one more. Ah, good, I'm tying it right. Last thing, this is from the New Testament. I th- actually thought of this on the way up here. I said, I need to put this in to finish. You sow what you reap. If you're going to act contrary to God and his son and the commandments, statutes, and laws that he has taught, then bad things are going to happen. For he that soweth to his flesh, do we see that a lot in this day and age? I think the answer is yes. What's the result? What is the consequence? shall reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, wow, what a great gift is this, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We're going to live forever. But are we sowing to the Spirit so we are cultivating that whole process? We're helping that process along because we're doing those things that are in accordance with what God says. All right, well, that's the, what I had today. I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, we got consequences. And my hope and prayer is that if nothing else, you'll think a little bit more when you do things. Maybe in the back of your mind you might say, well, that old white balding guy said that there might be consequences. So what are the consequences here? Well, we'll be back in about 15 minutes. Uh, Pastor, we'll start our main service. Pastor Johnson will be speaking. He also is a very good teacher. Um, like I like to listen to him because he he's explains the mechanics of things really well. Probably as good as anyone I know. So we'll see you in 15 minutes. Good morning, Spirit of Prophecy Church, and those of you that are watching online today. Uh, it's now time for tithes and offerings. Uh, there's two or three scriptures in the Bible that direct tithes and uh, 
tithes and offering, and one of them is in Malachi chapter 3, and you have one in Luke chapter 6. Well, I'm going to go over the one in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It starts with verse 6, and it's talking about sowing. It says, sow sparingly, and you shall reap sparingly. Sow abundantly, and you shall reap abundantly. And it says, every man should give of his heart as, as he can. It doesn't mean you have to give a whole bunch of money, or if you give a bunch, it doesn't, you know. But anyway, give what you can. If you can't afford it, then don't give it. But if you can't afford it, please do. And it says that he doesn't like you to give with a grudging heart or feel like you have to do it out of need. He loves a cheerful giver. So right now we do a prophetic thing in this church. If you'd like to step forward and place your offerings up there, we thank you. Also, there should be a code coming up online where they, you can make an online offering also. I don't see it yet, but they'll post it up there sooner or later. Dear Heavenly Father, I'd like you to bless everybody that has given this day, my Lord. They give it freely of their heart and freely of their will. You know their hearts, you know their intention, you know their love for you. I ask you to bless them tenfold, twentyfold, a hundredfold, one way or another. It always doesn't have to be financially. It could be with health, prosperity, all kinds of things. But we ask you to bless them this day in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And Lord, we just want to say thank you this morning. This is the day that you have made. We are rejoicing. We're glad in it. We give these gifts back to you, O Lord, because we know where our help comes from. It comes from you, O Lord. And so right now we magnify your name and we glorify your sweet name because you are the one that has done it for us. And so we celebrate you, continue to multiply these gifts in the name of Jesus and continue to, to spread your kingdom on this earth. In Jesus' name we pray. All right. How's everybody doing? Can I have the lights there? So today we're going to be talking about the bread and the cup. Today we join together and we're going to partake of the bread and the cup together. And we're going to do things a little bit different today. I'm going to teach on the bread and the cup today, and then we are going to partake as a church, as one body. Amen? Amen. So we'll talk about the bread and the cup. All right, so for our goals today is to understand the significance of the bread and the cup. And then secondly, is to allow that word, that eternal word, wash over us, to transform us from the inside out, to renew us and to renew our minds, as we see in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, posted right there at the bottom. And then lastly, to receive the gifts offered through partaking in the bread and the cup. All right, so we call that the Lord's Supper. Why do we do that? Well, of course, it's because it was the Lord's Supper. Whenever he had the final supper, it was a Passover supper that he, he joined with his disciples, and he knew that this night was a significant night, that he was going to give up his body and his blood for his sheep. So the accounts of this, is in Matthew chapter 26. We find it again in Mark chapter 14, as well as Luke 22. Oddly enough, one of my most favorite books of the Bible, which is the book of John, it's actually this account is not necessarily found, at least the supper part, but it had a twist on it. It was talking more about the ceremonial washing of the feet. So we at least got that addition, but it didn't detail about the Lord's Supper in this. And then we have a fourth account, and that's in 1 Corinthians 11, where the Apostle Paul was speaking to the church of Corinth. And he wrote in his epistles, and he referred to this Lord's Supper as the bread and the cup. And with this one, that's a little bit different from the other Gospels, is it details a warning compounded to it with that account. Oh, thank you. All right. And then... What does it mean? It's a symbol of fellowship. And that's why churches also call this communion, taking a holy communion. It's about 
communion with our Lord and becoming one. And so we're going to go into the very details. We're going to break it down first from the bread and from the cup. And of course, I'm excited about this topic. And so I pray that God will give me the diligence as a teacher to simplify it and not confuse because there's so much detail in here. It's so beautiful. We're going to start slowly. Uh, we're going to build upon a foundation and then we're going to build in layers. Amen. Okay, so we'll start with the bread and its significance. So there are several significance of bread. We have a symbol of labor and sustenance. So things that sustain us are food. We have leavened versus unleavened bread. We have bread as the instrument of communion. And then most importantly, manna from heaven. And that's where I want to spend most of my time today. God willing. So symbol of labor and sustenance in Genesis chapter three, all the way back to when uh, Adam and Eve were, you know, created and they were in the garden of Eden and they received a curse because they took of the forbidden fruit. And God said, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall, shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Okay, so now we see from the very beginning that bread was supposed to be our sustenance. Though before, it was supposed to be the very presence of God that would nourish our very soul, our very uh, physicality. Everything that we needed is in God. Um, also, there's an idiom that we say, putting bread on the table, right? Whenever we're working, somebody's got to put bread on the table. That's showing that it's sustenance. We're feeding our family. We also have Psalm chapter 104, verse 15. And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, meaning that wine brings joy. It's supposed to be a symbol of joy. And oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengthen a man's heart. So we see that it's further about sustenance. Now let's talk about leaven or sin and unleavened bread. Of course, we know that Jesus is our unleavened bread. We know that there is a feast dedicated to the unleavened bread, which signifies the haste in how the Israelites escaped or ex exited out of Egypt, right? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, before Paul even details the account of the Lord's Supper, he is calling out this church of Corinth and their sin. And he, he compares sin to the leaven. Remember, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? This is yeast, right? It's, it's going to raise up that bread. So that's why we we celebrate the unleavened bread like with, with flat bread. So if there's any sin in your camp, if there's any sin in your church, don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? This morning we had a great teaching from Danny about consequences. Now what are the consequences of us seeing this sin and allowing it to propagate in our church? Then what happens to that lump of bread? It's a whole, it leavens a whole lump. So that's why it was so significant. And again, bringing up Danny's teaching, I know he said that it, you know, back in the day, Old Testament rained down terror whenever there was one itty bitty ounce of sin. And it's not just because God is an evil God. He is showing you that he is holy and that he is blameless. He says, be perfect for I am perfect. Be holy for I am holy. This is the heart of God. And oh, so back to Corinthians what was happening in that time is there was a son that was sleeping with his father's wife. That is incest, that is sexual immorality, adultery, and so people must have been turning their cheek to this. And that is what something that Paul did not want in this church that he, he uh, raised up. So he condemned that. In Matthew chapter 16, as Jesus was traveling with his disciples uh, across the way, they saw the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, of course, you know, they had their own mind. Uh, they wanted to be prideful and be elevated beyond what they should have been. And Jesus uses leaven as a symbol, and he says, be careful what you partake in, what food you receive, Re receiving from the Pharisees. And he talks about a little leaven, right? And he's referring to false teaching as well as the false teachers in the Pharisees. The Pharisees were leading people astray for their own glory, causing this burden to be on people that was unattainable, right? Uh, again, we talked about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it calls its observers in that week 
to go through their house and to rid themselves of all leaven, meaning go through your heart, go through where you dwell and search your heart, right? Like how the psalmist says, search my heart, O God, try, try me, try my reins, right? Search your heart and search your house. Whatever you have that causes you to sin, it should be cast out. There is no leaven that should be with you. For the unleavened bread is talked about as sincere, truthful, and holy. All right, now that we covered that, let's talk about the instrument of communion. Whenever you and I commune, we're talking, we have a relationship, we are growing in one oneness and unity, right? So in the same way, whenever you sit down with somebody, back in the day is very important. That's why there's a covenant of salt. There is a covenant even whenever you're sitting down, you break bread and you have wine together. There is a lot of symbology in that, or is that even a word? Uh, a lot of symbols in there. So Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, talks about Melchizedek. And this one excited me. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Wow, there's a lot of bread and wine parallels in the Bible. Did you guys know that? Even with uh, whenever Joseph, whenever he went into jail, and then he was the tale teller. He was the one that was telling people of their dreams. And there were two people in particular from the Pharaoh's office that was thrown into prison. And it was a baker, and it was a... Uh, what is the word that they use? But it's a, somebody that, that details his wine, right? They, the, the servant that gives the, the cupbearer. There you go. Thank you. All right. So in Genesis chapter 18, verse 5, Abraham brought a morsel of bread for his heavenly guests. And this was before God rained uh, fire down on, um, on Sodom and Gomorrah. Exodus chapter 29, verse 40. And this is the continual and perpetual sacrifices that they offered every single day. They were to offer a he lamb that was without blemish, uh, actually two of them every day, one for the evening and one for the morning. And so with that, Exodus 29, 40 says, And with the one lamb, a tenth deal of flour, mingled with the fourth part of an hen of beaten oil, and the fourth part of an hen of wine for a drink offering. So there you go again in communion. There is bread and there is wine. Okay, now manna from heaven. There is a powerful, powerful parallel from Exodus chapter 16 when the Israelites were receiving this manna from heaven as well as John chapter 6 where Jesus says that he is the bread of life. In Exodus, I read from verse 4 and 15 out of chapter 16. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and for the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Now this is the central point of my message here. It's These things are tests. They're to prove and to make sure that people are walking in his ways. Amen? That whenever he gives a commandment or a statute, again, as Teacher Danny was claiming this morning, when he gives a teaching or a statute, or a law. Whenever you obey that, there is either, um, out of obedience, there is blessing, or out of disobedience, there is curses. So he's rewarding the people that follow him. He wanted to be their God, and them to be their people, whenever he called the children of Israel out from Egypt, right? So this is Israelites traveling out of Egypt, and they're receiving manna, because they were complaining this particular day. They said, Oh, Lord, seriously, you're going to bring us out of Egypt where we had bread and we had, you know, flesh pots where we could cook our own meals and we have nothing. You brought us out here to starve. This is your glory. And this is how they mocked him. So in response, he opened up the heavens. And whenever he opened up the heavens, this white substance fell down from, uh, from heaven to the earth. And it was like coriander seed and it was white and it was sweet to the taste. It was like honey. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. Manna, for they wist not what it was. They didn't know what it was. Before this, they received quail for eat, right, for meat. God blew quail into their camps, and they're like, Oh, okay, it's a bird, it's quail, I get it. But this one, they said, We wist not what it is. What is it? It it's must be manna, right? So 
Moses said unto them, This is bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. What is manna? Manna is what is it? That's what it means. What is it? But in the translation in Hebrew, it's translated as manhu. And this translation is masculine and singular, which is interesting because that question of how we translate what is it could also be interpreted as who is he? Who is he? So John chapter 6, verse 35 answers that question. Jesus, being the Alpha and Omega, the Ancient of Days, he knows from the beginning from the end, and he says, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. A little bit more about manna from heaven. Of course, here is the engineering side of my mind, so bear with me here. Uh, I think it's, it's so perfect. John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread. We know that Jesus is the bread on the right side. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, For there are, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these are three in one. Jesus is the Word, right? And we know that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the bread, he is the Word, and the Word was made flesh. In, in Hebrews, after his sacrifice, we learn that through his sacrifice, that veil was torn and rent in two so that we have access to the presence of God. And it also details that this veil rent in two, that was saying his flesh. His flesh was rent so we could go and enter into the most holy place, into the very presence of God through his sacrifice. So Jesus' flesh was rent in two. And Matthew chapter 26, verse 26 Jesus took the bread, and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Jesus is the bread. He is the word. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And then uh, Jesus' flesh was rent in two. Jesus also broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. Right? And then we're in Mark chapter 8, and he commanded the people to sit down on the ground and he took seven loaves and gave thanks and break. And this is the miracle that he did when everybody was searching for a sign and also following him for his beautiful teachings. And he fed all of them out of seven loaves. So after he gave thanks, he break it, and he gave it to his disciples to set before all of the crowd. And they did set them before the people. So on the right side, we see that God gave the bread, the broken bread, to his disciples to distribute to other people. In Acts chapter 13, verse 46, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So he's speaking to the Jews right now, and he's, he's saying that this is my calling that the Lord has made me a, an apostle to go and speak and, and bless the, the Gentiles with this gospel message. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, right? A light of truth, a bearer of truth, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. So we see that once God had broken bread, given it to his disciples, they are now administering to others so they can receive salvation. And if they reject, it's condemnation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 27, it talks about, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. And so we are now one with Christ. Whenever he says, May my word abide in you. If my word abideth in you, then you abide in me. Now, does it make sense? That the word was made flesh, dwelt among us. It was broken for us. It was distributed to us. We now receive and become partakers and become a part of the body of Christ as a wife and a husband conjoined together and are seen as one before God. Let no man break this that I've set before you, right? That I've, that I've joined together. Let no man break. So now we are one through this communion. Amen? 
And also, now, as the Father has sent Jesus, so now he sends us. And that's why we have the authority in his name to go and distribute this bread, this living bread, this word of God to other people unto them for salvation. So they may join us in oneness, in one accord, in one body in Christ. Amen? All right, that was, that was pretty wild, okay? Um, I also want to point out about the manna. There is so much richness in this that I might take a little bit of time here. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, I'm going to read through all of this here. It says, All the commandments which I command thee this day ye shall observe, and that ye may live, and multiply, and go in, and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. So this is what Moses is telling the Israelites, and it's the Lord telling the Israelites through Moses, right? He's promising of a beautiful promised land, one that is rich, flowing with milk and honey. And thou shalt remember all the way of which the Lord thy God led these the forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee, right? To humble thee and to prove thee. To know what is in thine heart and whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Amen? Amen. We're starting to see the effect of this bread. Remember whenever uh, man fell, now we have to toil and work hard diligently for our bread. By the sweat of our brow, we're able to enjoy this bread, and it's, it becomes our sustenance. It was never meant to be like that. But whenever we fell, that was the curse. This land is now cursed because of Adam, of what he has done. And so we see that God is ushering in a covenant with his people, saying, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so what's happening here is, you know, just as well as I do, that the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness, they experienced trials, fatal trials and tribulations every step of the way, whether it be hunger, whether it be thirst. Teacher Danny spoke about striking the rock and out gushed forth living water whether it be, um, you know, uh, sexual immorality or murmuring and the ground swallowed them up, whether it be poisonous serpents that bit them and they had no remedy except to look upon the brazen serpent that was raised, right? All of these things, they were able to survive only if they abided by the word of God. And it was proof, right? He's proving them. He says, here's my word. I'm taking you to the wilderness as a father Ch uh, chasten chasteneth his son or disciplines his son so I you and it's because of his love thy raiments waxed not cold upon thee or wax not old upon thee neither did thy foot swell these 40 years thou shalt also consider thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him do you guys remember why they were in the desert for 40 years. When they were numbered, in the book of Numbers, they selected one person from every of the 12 tribes. And out of those 12 people, they went to go scout the land of the promised land. And they waited, and they were there for 40 days, camped out over there. And what they came back with was those, those very large grapes, but they also came back with a bad report. And because they had a bad report, they said, we are like likened unto grasshoppers to these people. Surely we can't survive and we're not going to win. But the Lord God, through his mouth, he said, this is your promised land. Go and take it. And they did not listen. They made their own uh, observations. And because of it, they were, uh, they were cursed. So out of the 40 days, God tells, uh, tells Moses, for each one of those days, now you will wander in this wilderness one year for every single day that you were camped out. That is the answer why they were traveling for 40 years in the wilderness. It was because they were cursed, right? And their children would only be the ones to see that promised land because they believed and obeyed in this bad report that was not spoken from God, right? Okay, so there's even more. Don't get distracted with this picture on the right. This is just a map just to kind of map through uh, 
map through their, their pathway, right? Israelites, and this is how we can compare it from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So you're going to have to stick with me here. Of course, we know that Egypt is the land of oppression and worshiping of idols, many idols. That's why there were 10 plagues. 10 plagues for each of those gods that they believed in. God said, there is no other gods but me, right? That's why he did those plagues to mock their gods and to show that he has all power and all might. In Egypt, the land of oppression and idols, then they traveled to the wilderness. Moses contended against Pharaoh and said, we need to go to the wilderness to worship our God. Of course, he spoke to Pharaoh, which is the leader of their oppression. And they were led to the Red Sea where it was almost like the end of their story. But God had a miracle uh, in store for them. Then they received the tablets of the law to keep them on the right path. They had manna, the heavenly bread that fed them. Also, Moses was their leader, and then, it, and then it changed to Joshua, where Joshua was the leader to lead them into the land of Canaan, or the promised land. And before they did this, they had to cross the Jordan River to Canaan. And once they did that, they were able to enter into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. Now, why is all this essential when I'm talking about the bread and the cup? Because this has everything to do with the manna. All right, in Egypt, the New Testament parallel, where we are today. Uh, first, in our Egypt, we were enslaved to sin in this world. We were spiritually dead, as it illustrates in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And we were dead to our trespasses. And then we heard the gospel. That's the beginning of our wilderness. The beginning of our wilderness is our journey of faith. We are walking and traveling. So you and I are argu arguably in our wilderness right now. We're walking through this faith, and we're being tempted by these idols, false idols, uh, a temptation to murmur, and all of these things. And there is a Pharaoh. It is Satan. Satan is the leader of our oppression, and he is actually pursuing you. He is the prince of this air. He's pursuing you in your wilderness, in my wilderness, and he's trying to cause you, he's trying to lay snares and traps so that you will never get to that destination. The Red Sea. Whenever they crossed that, it's like baptism from death unto life. So as we cross through the Red Sea, it's our baptism into this newness, into this new life with Christ. The tablets of the law is our scripture, which guides us. It is like a lamp unto our feet, right? And a light unto our path. Manna, the heaven, the heavenly bread. This is Jesus, the Christ. He just said, you know, the Pharisees came up to him and they said, oh, our fathers had a sign. Through Moses, they received manna from heaven. So if you're truly from God, what sign do you have? Well, Jesus said, I am the manna, right, John? I am the manna from heaven. I am that bread from heaven that whenever you partake of me, you will never hunger again. You will never thirst again in your life. So this manna was taken every single day. As soon as the heavens opened up, this white substance fell to the ground and it was like dew, right? And it was, it was likened unto coriander seeds. It was white and it was sweet like honey. So they would take of this from day one to day six. But on the sixth day, the day before Sabbath, they were to collect their portion, but double, double portion. So that way they didn't have to work on the seventh day. They were to rest, but still have enough manna from the previous day, right? So they did this every single day until they got up to the, the river of Jordan, the Jordan River. And it says that manna, whenever they crossed, the manna stopped falling. So every single day in the wilderness, they were to be sustained and strengthened by this heavenly manna every single day until they reached the promised land. So from Moses to Joshua, Moses, whenever we think about Moses, we think about him as the law, right? And then when we think about Joshua, he became the leader to lead and guide people into the promised land by grace. He was only the leader by grace. So interestingly enough, in the book of Numbers, whenever they were numbering the people and or they were saying, OK, let's take one person from every tribe to go scout the land. Joshua's name was Oshea. It said Oshea, the son of Nun, comma, Joshua. I don't think that that was a mistake. I think that that 
made Joshua become a type of Jesus because Joshua is Yeshua. That's the translation. Yeshua is he has become our salvation, which is Jesus. So you see, it was never the law that was meant to usher us into the promised land, but it was always grace through Jesus. Jesus being our salvation. Crossing the Jordan River to Canaan. So there is a word that is used in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament called exodon. It's a, it's a departure or uh, being deceased. You know, first or in Second Peter, Peter is talking about how the Lord told him how he was going to depart from this world, and he used exodon. So whenever we hear exodus, of course, we think about Israelites exiting out of Egypt. But when you think about exodon, it's a departure. So whenever we're here on this earth, we're making our great departure from this earth, from the wilderness, into the promised land, which is heaven. Do you see that? And the most special part about this, ladies and gentlemen, is the word of God or the, the bread from heaven that is raining down for us to take is our sustenance while we are in the wilderness until we reach the promised land. Thank you, Lord. Can I say that again? That the manna was created to be the very sustenance and strength of the Israelites as long as they were in the wilderness because they had nothing. God said, listen to my words and you will survive and you will have life and life in abundance. And all of these things looked scary to them. They were tempted to do their own things, what was right in their own mind. But everything, it, man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So they were to eat of the manna every single day while they were in the wilderness until the day that they crossed the Jordan River into their promised land, into salvation. Hallelujah. So what do we do? We partake of this heavenly manna of Jesus the Christ, of the very word of God that became flesh and dwelt among us. We're able to partake of this word and also distribute it to his people every single day that we live on this earth until we reach our heavenly place. And he is our sustenance. What happens is Jesus has become, let me just go back real quick. Jesus has become our salvation. He is the fulfillment of all this. Oh my goodness, I'm fighting this. Okay, can you help me out? Get me back to that, that page of the map, please. So Jesus has become our salvation. He has become our sustenance. Every single word that he preaches, that he speaks, has life in us. And we're able to receive from him. He is the vine and we are the branch. We cannot have fruit unless we are connected to him. And he says, abideth in me and I abide in you. So when his word abideth in you, you abide in him and you are made one. So uh, also we have a beautiful picture of the bride and the groom. Remember that he is the bridegroom and we are the bride. And before, uh, before the groom was able to have his own bride, he would go to their house, to the house of the bride and speak with his father or the, the bride's father. And they would sit down and they would have bread and wine to consummate that agreement in communion. So if you think about it, sorry if, if you think this is too graphic, but it's like so intimate, it's like intercourse. You are joined with that person. You are joined. And so when we talk about communion, you are joining yourself to the living word of God. Okay, let's talk about the cup. The cup and its significance. So when we talk about the cup, oh, sorry, Danny, can you help me out there? We're just going to go to that next slide. The significance of the cup is about portion and about judgment. We'll see on this next slide, there's two Psalms that we'll read from that indicates that this cup is detailing what our portion is. In Psalm chapter 16, verse 5, the Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. In Psalm chapter 11, verse 6, it's almost the opposite. It's on the negative side. Upon the wicked, he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. Or tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. That's judgment. Matthew, verse 26, 39. Of course, we remember Jesus, our Christ, whenever he went to 
Gethsemane, as Pastor Stan, I believe he says, Geshmone. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So we see that there is a cup and there is a meaning behind this cup. Remember the brothers of Zebedee, James and John, where the mother approached Jesus and was like, please, Lord, I believe that that you are the Christ. I hope that my sons can sit on your left hand and your right hand in your, your, in your glory. And he's like, you don't know what you're asking with all due respect. Are you able to sip of my cup? Oh, yeah, surely. Sure. Give us your cup. We'll take well, whatever. What are you drinking? That's judgment, right? So as we have covered last time, we talked a lot about the blood sacrifice. So I'm not going to go too far into it. I'll just read these verses. First John chapter 3, Whosoever uh, committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for the sin is the transgressions of the law. If you sin one sin, you break the law. It doesn't matter. There, there are people that are, being, um, that are being in the news right now, and these guys are super sinful. I'm not even going to name them. But if I think about it, if I sin once, I'm just as guilty as those people, Right? That's why a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We are to be holy as he is holy. And he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's in 1 John chapter 1. So what do we do? Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Leviticus chapter 17 verse 11. This was one that we focused on last week. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for our souls. So what does this blood signify? It signifies the new covenant. As you guys have seen and heard, the old covenant did not work. They were given the word of God, and they did not achieve it. That's why they wandered in the wilderness 40, day, or 40 years. And those people, that generation, did not see the promised land. Is that a symbol for us today that we are to receive the very word of God and to abide by it? Because man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Remember when I said that Jesus is the fulfillment of the scriptures, not a single yod or tittle, which is like the smallest letters in the Hebrew um, alphabet, will be, will be missed. Every single one of them will be achieved through Jesus. So whenever he received Holy Spirit, whenever he was baptized by John the Baptist, and then the descendant, or, and then you have the Spirit descend upon him like a dove, then he goes into the wilderness and fasted 40 days, 40 nights, so that way he can cover the things that the Israelites could not do. And then the oppressor comes, Satan, and what did he tempt with? Oh, you must be hungry, Jesus. Uh, these stones sure look delicious. I mean, don't you have all the power in the world as a son of God to change these stones into loaves of bread? And what did Jesus say? Man must not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 8, verse 7 to 10. For if that, the first covenant, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So if the first was faultless, then we shouldn't be putting in place a second, a second covenant. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day, when I took them by the hand to lead them out to the land of Egypt, because, oh, sorry, to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. That is the power of the bread and the cup. Now it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Paul is accounting all of these things and he's mentioning to uh, the church of Corinth and he says, as it has been delivered to me, so I also deliver and administer to you. 
He's talking about the cup, the, the bread and the cup. For as often, and I'm skipping through it because we know how it goes, that on that night he was betrayed, he took the bread, this is Jesus. He broke the bread, and, or he gave thanks. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, eat it, for this is my body, which is given up for you. In the same manner, he took the cup, and again he gave thanks and said, take this, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It is shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. So we speed along to verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he comes. Right? It's a depiction of his death. His body was broken for us, and his blood was shed for the remission of our sins. So now every single time we take it, we are showing the Lord's death until that day that he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. So, of course, for me, I'm like, oh, what makes us unworthy, right? Let's do a study on this. But let man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Teacher Danny talked about a huge chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 28, this morning. And he says, yeah, there are blessings here, but there is a slew of lists upon lists of curses if you are disobedient to this word. Where do you think that sickness comes from and sleep? If we take partake of this body and blood in an unworthy manner, we are susceptible to to sickness, we're susceptible to curses because this is so serious that the body and the blood that was shed for us, that we must take this and also be Christians and walk as Christ has walked. That is how serious it is. For if we judge, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, meaning that you're constantly examining yourself and you're bringing all of, all of your sins, all of your accolades, everything to the feet of Christ because he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You lay it at your feet. He has already shed his blood. He is yesterday, today, and forever. He is the priest, the high priest in the order of Melchizedek in the highest place, and he will not die again. He is perpetual. He is perpetually our propitiation, our covering for our sins. So we go to him, the high priest, every single time that we sin, and we ask for forgiveness and cleanse ourselves so that way we may be worthy to partake in this uh, bread and cup. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord uh, that we should not be condemned with the world. So, of course, as I would look upon JC, Lila, and Ethan, if they're doing something wrong, I correct it. If I don't correct it, do I love them? I might be condemning them with the rest of the world. Sure, do as you see fit, honey. Go. No, that is not the heart of God. Wherefore, my brethren, ye come together to eat, tarry one for another, to stay with one another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Remember when I talk about communion, sitting at a table. Imagine all throughout Proverbs, if you sit at the table of scoffers, you're likened unto those scoffers, right? You are agreeing with the things that they do. So whenever Paul confronts the church of Corinth, he tells them, I have seen that there is sexual immorality here. There is leaven that is surely to leaven the whole lump if you do not take it out of the camp. Also, he talks about an adulterous spirit. Whenever you partake of this bread and wine, this bread and the cup, make sure you're doing it in a worthy manner. If you are doing anything outside of this, outside of the gospel, and maybe it's a sacrifice to idols, and you're partaking of that, you are sitting with demons, and you are agreeing with them, and you are worshiping them in a sense, which God is provoked to jealousy. He wants you, and he wants all of you. He wants your entire heart. He wants to write his law upon your heart and upon your mind so that you will be saved, and you will be together with him in communion. Amen? All right, so a little bit more about this. 
about walking in an unworthy manner. Another thing is acting in a way that perverses the gospel. So the Lord's Supper is a parallel. It is the breaking of the body and the blood that was shed for us. So whenever you eat and drink of this in an unworthy manner, it's a way of abusing that meal. Uh, number two, it doesn't discern the, if you don't discern the power of the body and the blood of Christ correctly, then you might also have those curses laid upon you as well. The bread and the cup are meant to represent Jesus' body and blood, and eating and drinking without properly understanding this could be considered unworthy. Uh, the participants are people are participating in a, a divided community. Remember, in this community, as we saw in the Church of Corinth, there might be uh, you know, many members, but there is only one body. And this body, everybody was baptized into, into Christ's body. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it talks about a certain order, that the woman glorifieth the man, and the man glorifies Jesus as the head, and Jesus glorifies the Father. So we see that there is a structure here. And so whenever we think about the body of Christ, Jesus is that head, and we are the body, right? So we are to glorify Jesus. So we are to be one body in, one, in, one, in unity, right, in one spirit. So if there's any conflicts or divisions within the community, participating in communion may be seen as inappropriate. Remember it says in the Bible, if you have anything against your brother, go and make amends with him before you place your sacrifice before the altar. Uh, on, on number four, take communion with the wrong mindset. This can include not resolving conflicts or not truly repenting of sins, knowing fully well where you're hiding your leaven, right? Only you know, church, we need to take this leaven out, even within ourselves. I know that that was another point that Mr. Danny brought up is about judgment. We are to be these judges upon one another because we are made kings and priests. And it's not me judging you because I think I'm better than you, but I know the word of God. And the word of God says, walk and be holy for he is holy. So all of these things that present itself as leaven unto the church, it is important for us to point them out. Amen? Amen. All right, so can I get my helpers to go and prepare the Lord's Supper? We're going to take it. We're going to pray together. And we are believing that we are now changed because the word of God is so rich and it has life for us today. Uh, my, my entire goal was, was to display this word the same way that I received it. And I have been so encouraged and inspired that every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, that is how I live. Every single word, whatever is said out there, oh, you're about to lose your job. I'm about to fire you. Okay. You don't give me life, you know? That's very radical, I understand. But every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is God not the God that can sustain even the widow whenever she only had a little bit of oil and a little bit of bread or a little bit of flour? He caused it to come out out of nowhere. Was God the one that fed the people when they had no food? Manna rained from heaven. What about thirst? Are you thirsty? Didn't he strike the rock? and out gush forth eternal water, you are able, through the word of God, to live. So the takeaways here, uh, you guys can come closer. Uh, the takeaways here is the bread secures strength and salvation and truth and a path to life. The cup symbolizes the renewed covenant that the Spirit writes the word of God upon your hearts, upon our hearts. And it's a reminder to join in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are proclaiming his death until he comes. The powers in the gifts of the Lord's Supper, it contains life, it contains strength, it contains forgiveness. It contains an invitation to commune with the living God every single day. That we're able to walk through the veil into the most holy place because Jesus rent the veil, and it was torn in two, which was his flesh. And then also remember, it's okay. Practice. Practice this. Are we supposed to do it once a month? Every single day until we reach the promised land are we to do this. Paul says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance. 
So we're going to do that. I'm going to end with this. Luke chapter 24, verse 13 through 32. It always gives me the chills. If you guys know this one, it's about when Jesus was with those followers that were walking towards uh, Emmaus. Okay, so this, the, let, me, let me set up the, the background here. So this is the third day, and, and this is after Jesus sacrificed his body, right? After the Passover lamb gave it up. And these followers, there was two of them, they were walking to a city called Emmaus, and they were, dis, like, they were disheartened. Their heart was down, their face was down, their countenance was down. And who was to join them but Jesus himself? And he walks by them. What's going on? Like, why, why the long face? Well, we had a Messiah, and he, he claimed this, this, and that, and he died, and we're here now. I mean, I just, I don't know. Okay, well, he walks with them. From the time of Moses all the way up until the present day, he was able to take the scripture, to take the books of knowledge, to take the poetry and all of the history of Israel, and he was able to beautifully show them and teach them everything. And these guys were stunned. They were like, wow. And so Jesus, of course, being Jesus, he's like, yeah, I'm going to continue forth this way. And they said, Lord, please tarry with us one night. Please, please just stay with us. This is an amazing time we're enjoying. Here, come to our house and we have bread. Um, join us for, for supper. Is that okay? Okay, okay. He goes and he takes the bread. He breaks the bread, and before he's even giving it to his disciples, their eyes, this is the Christ. This is he. He is here. He is risen. He has resurrected. He has a resurrecting power. He is the life and the resurrection. He is the living bread that we can take of today. He broke the bread, and now he's giving to his disciples. Why did he do that as one of his first acts coming back? We are to take this and to continue to do it in remembrance of him. And this is to keep us holy, to remember that the blood was shed for the remission of our sins so we can walk blameless and upright, that we could, be, we could have crimson stains washed white as snow. And now we have holy garments ready for that wedding supper of the Lamb. And then the bread, the bread is for life, is for the very word of God that we are receiving. Remember whenever the disciples went and preached the word and said, if you reject it, you are putting on yourself condemnation. So when you receive this bread, you're receiving Christ. Amen? So let's pray for this real quick, and then we'll distribute. Um, actually, let me take one here. Okay, and you can distribute, and I'll be praying for it. So Lord, we say thank you for today's message. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you that you have grace over us enough that we can just have faith and believe on your name and we will be saved. And through our actions that follow today, may we be walking in a worthy manner. May we take this bread and recognize that this is the body that was broken for us. May we take this cup and realize that we also do not want to place judgment upon ourselves except that holy judgment that you have said that we are righteous and we are made kings and priests of the Most High God. Right now, I am proclaiming that there is victory in the name of Jesus. We have victory by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. We love our lives even not unto death. We are receiving salvation through you. You have become our salvation, Yeshua. That's what it means. We say thank you, Jesus, for your love for us. Thank you for your sacrifice that you had given unto us as our Passover Lamb, even as our scapegoat. You have taken away our sins and you have doused them away, you have hid them into the sea of forgetfulness. So why should we not walk as free people? I pray, Almighty Father, that as we take of this cup, that it will bring joy to our life from here on out, that we will remember what you have done, that even the things that trouble us, O oh Lord, that we place them aside, and we can rejoice in the King of kings and the Lord of lords and what he has done for us this day and every day after. We say thank you, Almighty Father. We recognize you as the bread of life. We recognize you as the worthy lamb that was slain so we could receive power in this blood. We cover ourselves with the blood of Jesus. We cover those that are listening to my voice online with the blood of Jesus. And we are saying thank you for the remission of sins of the entire world. 
if we're all ready to partake in the bread and the cup, then I'll go ahead and recite. On that night he was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat from it, for this is my body which is given up for you. And they ate. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks and said, take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It is shed for you. It is shed for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in remembrance of me. And they drank. Hallelujah. Oh, there's a spirit of worship in here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We are free people indeed, and you have made us kings and priests of the Most High God. We worship you. We love you in this place. We magnify your name, for you are holy. There is none like you. You are holy. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. There is nothing that you cannot do. I pray today, O Lord, that you would break every curse and break every spirit of oppression in the name of Jesus, that this common day Pharaoh, Satan, has no power over us. Greater is he that is within us than he that is within the world. We mark our hearts with your perfect blood that was sacrificed for us for the remission of our sins. We have been cleansed and we have been washed white as snow, not because of our works, but because of your grace, O Lord. We worship you and we love you, O Lord. I pray that your power through your word is spoken through these cameras and to whoever is listening on the other side of this and to every single person in this church. May you have your way. May you continue to speak through Holy Spirit and reveal your truths unto us from today going forward. We are vowing today that you are our manna and we will continue to take of you, to eat of you the very word of God because that has life. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to be in communion with you, to take the Lord's Supper in celebration of who you are and who we are in you, O Lord. Thank you for making us one as one church, one body. We continue to cast out all divisive plans of the enemy and may you cause us to examine our hearts daily to remember what you have done and to walk holy for you are holy and to walk and be perfect for you. O Lord, are perfect. We magnify and glorify your name. It is in Jesus' name that we pray and that we trust and that we believe. Amen. Amen. All right, Lord, uh, thank you so much for your word. And everybody here, uh, we love you uh, with an everlasting love that God has for us. It's just it's, a, it's an abundance. It overflows. He makes our cup overflow with. Amen? Amen? Going forward, may he embolden you and enrich in you with the word of God. As you speak the word of God, people are healed and saved in the name of Jesus. So we say thank you, Lord, and thank you all for joining us, and we will see you next week. Have a blessed week. Goodbye now. <laughs>